Welcome to Reconnect, the podcast dedicated to sharing and defending the good news of Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus died for sins, was buried, and on the third day was raised again according to the scriptures for our salvation. It is through Jesus alone that we are reconnected into a right relationship with God. Reconnect us, O Lord. All right, welcome to another episode of Reconnect. As we focus on sharing and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, which is the message that reconnects us into a right relationship with the Lord. Uh, in the last episode, episode 32, uh, it was a Halloween special. I know people maybe uh, don't like necessarily the association of Halloween, but we talked about ghosts uh, because I found a survey that said that uh, even within Christian circles, a large percentage of people are saying that they believe they can communicate with the dead. And along in those surveys, one of them was that 24% of Christians today in America claim they believe in reincarnation, uh, that people will be reborn in this world again and again. And I, I find that uh, so disheartening to hear because uh, this belief of reincarnation does not in any way fit with the biblical view of having one life and then being judged at the end of that life. Uh, and it doesn't fit with the resurrection of the dead as promised in Daniel 12, just one place in Scripture where it says all the dead will be raised. Uh, uh, so uh, to help with this discussion, I wanted to uh, have Mike Shreve with me, and he, uh, he agreed to be a guest for this episode. Mike, how are you doing? Well, I'm thrilled uh, to be connecting with you on this Reconnect program. So, uh, listeners, I found out about Mike uh, because he somehow found my stuff online and uh, reached out to me and shared a book that he wrote called In Search of the True Light. Uh, it's a book that will be linked on this episode, so episode 33 at andyrasman.com for Reconnect. Um, you'll, you'll see a link to his ministry, which is Mike Shreve Ministries. Uh, he's the pastor at the Sanctuary in Cleveland, Tennessee, as well as the founder of a publishing company called Deeper Revelation Books. And he's written a lot of books himself. Online it says 13 books. But, Mike, is that number accurate? Is it now 14 with your latest book on why Christians shouldn't practice yoga? Um, I think it's. Still, I think that includes it, uh, the number 13. <laughs> okay, good. So. <laughs> All right, good. So uh, 13 books, which is a lot. And uh, just seeing In Search of the True Light, I am so impressed with this book. And uh, I thought there was a thing he wrote in here which really let me know he'd be a good person to talk to about responding to this belief of reincarnation. Because uh, in his book, he has a section of 30 questions that we should ask. Uh, and these questions are really addressed to people that are seeking the truth uh, coming out of Eastern religions. And so one of them was about which is the right view, resurrection or reincarnation. So, uh, Mike, I'm just curious to start with, are you surprised to hear that 24% of Christians in America say they believe in reincarnation? Well, yes and no. I, I would have to know exactly how that poll was conducted. Mm -hmm. And if they were genuine Bible-believing Christians who have a true born-again experience, I would, uh, I would doubt those, that number or that percentage, mm -hmm. but there, uh, they may have interviewed, uh, many who are professing Christians who have not necessarily had a personal encounter with the Lord. And quite often people grow disenchanted with a powerless form of Christianity and begin exploring other options as a result. So, uh, it, it does shock me uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, I see the same thing happening in Judaism, for instance, because uh, because the Jewish people, to a great degree, in the beginning, rejected Jesus as the Messiah, the hunger in man for a supernatural reality caused them to pursue what later became known as Kabbalah, which... Mm. Uh, is uh, like a New Age form of Judaism. So people try to compensate for that lack of a reality of God by exploring other options. Right. Um, which is something you did, too. You speak about that a lot in A Search for the True Light. 
as well as you have a, a booklet which is Encountering God. Uh, and listeners, I'll, I'll have links to the, the Encountering God booklet on his website. It's a, it's a great testimony of how uh, Mike found himself believing in reincarnation, practicing yoga, and then was miraculously brought out of this through an encounter with Christ. So, Mike, I was just curious if you could share with the listeners uh, what it was that first attracted you uh, into Eastern spirituality, into the New Age movement, and what you found attractive about reincarnation when you first uh, dove into it. Well, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and I met a lot of wonderful, humble, kind, generous-hearted people in the Church, but I was never introduced uh, to a personal relationship with the Lord. And so my quote-unquote Christianity was primarily historical. I I believed in a historical Christ who died on the cross and rose from the dead, etc. But it wasn't a living reality in my life. And so when I became a teenager, I drifted further and further from religion. I became a rock musician and began dabbling in some hallucinogenic drugs uh, in the hope of not just partying, but in the hope of expanding my consciousness or being mm. awakened to a higher reality as uh, mm-hmm. many were touting that could come to pass uh, through drug use back in the latter 60s, early 70s. And uh, I had a very, very bad experience one time where I came very close to death. And uh, I don't believe it was just a hallucination. I, I, My body went into convulsions. I was really in bad shape. And when I came down off of that experience, I realized I was playing Russian roulette with my life. I, I was not on a path that would lead to any kind of resolving of the issues and the questions that I had in my heart. So, uh, so I made an abrupt and radical change. I... I decided never to do drugs again, mm. and I kept that promise to myself. And I dropped out of college, which is not something I necessarily uh, advocate now, but <laughs> it was my way of dealing with it. I dropped out of college with one intention in mind, and that was to search for God until I found him. And the prevailing attitude culturally in that day during the Jesus Movement era, or rather the Flower Child era, uh, that later gave birth to the Jesus Movement era, uh, was a disenchantment with uh, traditional forms of religion mm-hmm. and uh, uh, becoming enamored with Far Eastern expressions. Uh, you know, the book Beatles were studying under their Swami, and so I met an Indian guru and became a very devoted follower and studied... Uh, under uh, Yogi Bhajan and his particular sect or expression of yoga is called Kundalini Yoga, which is supposed to be an amalgamation of all these different types of yogas into one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I became very passionate about it to the point where I was spending 12 to 14 hours a day in solitude. Wow. Uh, with a very disciplined life. Uh, every day started off with a couple of hours of meditation. And then the whole day was regimented uh, with various spiritual exercises. And uh, I, I thought I was getting closer to God because it was a semblance of peace in my life. Uh, of course, I was totally focused on eternal things and, and not indulging in temporal things at all, except the necessities of life. But uh, I still had an empty heart. And uh, what happened uh, very shortly in my testimony uh, the Tampa Tribune newspaper did a big article on me uh, explaining how I was teaching yoga at four universities in the Tampa area, and I was running a yoga ashram at the time to a commune where people study on a more intense level. And uh, I thought that article would alert more people to my uh, classes, and I'd see a dramatic increase. Instead, it alerted this radical prayer group in town that believed that intercession can make a difference in their city. Mm -hmm. And and so they read that article, and they said, not on our watch. We're going to pray over this person. 
and they put me on a 24-hour prayer chain <laughs> where somebody was seeking God on my behalf every hour of every day. Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, and so for three or four weeks, I'm, I'm uh, the subject of a lot of people's prayer. <laughs> and uh, and God, thank God, he answered uh, in a dramatic series of events that all linked together. First of all, I got a letter from an old friend of mine. Uh, he and I had dropped out of college to study under different grooves at the same time. Well, he tells me how he walked in a church and heard an audible voice say, Jesus is the only way, and he felt the Spirit of God come upon him, and he said he was born again. Mm -hmm. Well, I wrote him back and explained to him that I was happy he had found Christianity as his path, but that I could not confine my beliefs to one religion, my belief system to one religion. So that letter weighed on my mind. I just could not imagine how Larry could opt for a single path like Christianity. And so I was thinking deeply about it. And then uh, one day I decided, I came to the conclusion that maybe I had misjudged Christianity and maybe I had overlooked uh, something about Jesus' teaching that was vital. And, and so I decided if I was going to be fair with God, fair with myself as a truth seeker, I would not be closed-minded. Mm -hmm. So I dedicated an entire day to Jesus. And I said, if you're real, I believe you'll give me a sign today. And I prayed all day long. That afternoon, one of the members of the prayer group, who happened to be a former student of Yogananda, mm -hmm. who uh, is uh, very famous among people that are devoted to Eastern religions in the West, in fact, you're out in California. Uh, uh, you're probably not too far from Self-Realization Fellowship. Uh, but anyway, uh, anyway, he was one of his former students, and he was a member of this prayer group, and he was a Christian now and had departed from the practice of Eastern religions. And he was two miles away from me that afternoon when I stepped out on the road hitchhiking. Mm. He was walking into a laundromat. The Holy Spirit spoke to his heart and said, get back in your vehicle and start driving. That's all the instructions God gave. And he thought it quite strange. Uh, whenever he felt an impulse, he would turn. And God led him to the very spot where I was hitchhiking. And he was probably one of the only people that could have led me to the Lord because he absolutely understood everything I believed in. And uh, long story short, I knelt down with him in the back of the van and gave my heart to Jesus within about an hour. Uh, because when I stepped in his van, I looked up and he had a picture of Jesus taped to the ceiling of the van. And I knew this was the answer. Yeah. This was the sign I'd been praying for all day long. Uh -huh. And the the rest, praise God, is history uh, of a pivotal point in my life where everything changed. Wow, tr truly amazing. I even like just hearing that testimony. When I when I read it in Encountering God that you wrote, it's it's online for free too, listeners, this Encountering God. It's something you could share with anyone that you know is into Eastern spirituality, New Age stuff. He's written it in such a way that he uses their language that they would recognize and understand. Um, and it's it's done in such a loving manner, too, that like you can definitely see his heart for the lost in it. So I highly recommend uh, getting that free PDF on their page or ordering some of these to share with people. Uh, but, Mike, when I, when I first read that, I was really convicted on uh, just how this group prayed so much for you and just the power of prayer. Um, because I, I think oftentimes when it comes to sharing the gospel, maybe we lean on our own intuition or abilities but really it's it's we we need to be starting and ending and using prayer throughout the entire process when we are uh seeking to share the gospel of someone so i, I was really touched I agree. By that. yeah it's very very no, go powerful. ahead i was just saying i agree yeah it's very 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 powerful and so just since the show is dedicated to sharing the gospel uh that's something i would almost recommend if you know someone's not christian in your life uh put their name down on a piece of paper and begin praying for them and invite others to do the same. Okay, so with reincarnation, uh did when you were a teacher of yoga, were you teaching more than just yoga? Were you also teaching beliefs on reincarnation and karma and if 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 you were, like how would you try to convince people that it was actually true? Was it just trying to get them to experience what you were experiencing or did you have things you would point to? And I'm asking this because I'm thinking if we can see 
what gets people into it, it can help us understand maybe some things to speak to them to help walk them out of it. Well, I definitely did uh, share re- uh, a belief in reincarnation as well as other beliefs drawn from Hinduism throughout my classes. Now, they were primarily uh, the asanas, which are the physical exercises, and the pranayama, which is the breathing exercises, where you breathe in, uh, uh, in, in, into the depth of your lungs, the air around you, because Incidentally, let me interject this. Uh, the belief is that uh, there's a divine essence that permeates the whole universe in the form of something Hindus call prana, okay. and that's in the air. So when you're breathing in the air it's, and, and you're focused on breathing exercises, it's like you heighten your sensitivity to the divine presence. But uh, I have an acronym for yoga, Andy. It's Y-O-G-A. You only get air. <laughs> That's good. You you can't you can't breathe your way into a relationship with God. But uh, anyway, uh, to answer your question, uh, I primarily embraced reincarnation because I saw all the inequities of life. I saw so many situations that made it look like there was injustice in the universe. Mm. And that God was an unjust God. One child is born perfectly normal. Another child is born with terrible physical disabilities or mental retardation. Uh, one person is born into a prosperous family. Another person is born into abject poverty. One person dies at an early age. Another, the wicked, may live to be over a hundred. Nothing seemed equal and fair. Mm-hmm. And so my logic when I, I didn't really think it through, I don't. Uh, mm. I don't believe at this point. I just grasped at it because it seemed to answer that particular question that was resounding in my heart: How can life be fair? And right. and if you die at an early age as a child, you haven't had an opportunity to learn the lessons that others learn in life, or to make the choices that prove whether or not you're worthy of eternal life, which was my mindset back then. I right. felt like it was something you had to work your way to attain. Uh, so it just it did not make sense. Yeah. I have explanations now, but that was my primary motivation. Very and, interesting. Uh, it was, in, in a sense, it was my attempt to preserve the integrity of the character of God. Mm-hmm. That... Uh, it's the only way he could be a just God, by giving everyone a fair chance at a fulfilling existence over and over again until they completely fulfilled their destiny. Yeah. So it so it just seemed appealing or more fair. That's pretty interesting. Because I'm, I'm curious, because I, I was asking this question because I, I went on a tour of a Buddhist temple once, and it was in a large group, and I didn't get to necessarily interact as much as I would have wanted to with the guide uh but she led us into a room and sat us down and began to teach some about what they believe is buddhist and she did mention reincarnation within their religion and i guess for some reason because she knew the people there weren't buddhist she felt compelled to try to give some justification of why this is true um and uh she went with people that had uh past life memories uh, which I don't think many people have past life memories, which I would say would be something that definitely goes against reincarnation and can even show why this view of reincarnation is actually unjust because the people don't know why they're even in the situation they're in in this life. They don't know what they did in the previous life, if this was true, um, to get them to where they are now. But she, she began sharing stories of uh, different kids that, for some reason, seem to know things that they shouldn't know. Maybe know things from World War II, but uh, they weren't born during the era. And then throughout certain things, they realize, oh, you're actually the soul of Uncle so-and-so. Um, have you heard of people trying to do studies in that to show past life experiences or people having memories of previous decades, uh, which they weren't alive in, uh, and linking it up with other people which have already been deceased as justification for reincarnation? Uh, yes, I have, Andy. I, I, 
Uh, I haven't researched it deeply myself Mm -hmm. uh, because I know what I believe concerning that. But in my conversations with people who embrace Far Eastern religions uh, over the past four decades plus, uh, quite often they'll bring that up as the primary proof that and uh, experiencing past lives, uh, past life uh, memories through hypnosis is another primary thing they bring up. Mm. And uh, my belief on both of those would not be acceptable to someone who embraces the theory or the idea of reincarnation. Mm. And so I don't really press this issue. There's some other illogical things about reincarnation that I believe are more powerful in disproving it. Mm. But uh, to answer your question, uh, I believe that there may be. I have not personally been acquainted with people. I've read accounts of children, especially, that had remembrances of places and people they normally should not have. And uh, my only way of explaining that is that this world is full of demonic influences. And, and one of the main ways that Satan and his underlings try to keep the human race in deception is through false religion. Mm-hmm. And, and so demons uh, do not die. And they've been around since the fall of, of Satan. They've been around from the very beginning, and so a a demonic power may be very familiar with some personality from the 12th century or the 13th century, because maybe that's where that demon was located. And uh, and so that influence of that demonic presence could impart that kind of knowledge or subtly... uh, Cause flashes of a supposed memory uh, in the in interacting with the mind of a person. Right. Uh, that's that's the only way I can explain it. Yeah. Uh, and, that's really uh, good. Uh, same thing uh, with the other scenario that I mentioned. Uh, I believe when a person submits to hypnosis, uh, mm-hmm. that there is a demonic power involved there that will be very obliging at giving false. Experiences. In fact, I think it's um, it's significant to see that Edgar Casey had a huge struggle. He would go into these trances where he would give people readings, and and he was originally a Sunday school teacher who was very fervent about a biblical world, and and he knew that the idea of reincarnation conflicted with the Bible, and so he had a, a personal battle for a season of his life intellectually over why he had these experiences in this hypnotic, self-hypnotic kind of state, Hmm. Uh, even though it countered the Bible that he held dear. And, uh, of course, I believe somehow he came under demonic influence. Hmm. Yeah, uh, when, when, when I hear such things, I instantly thought demonic as well, Uh, but... Kind of what you were saying was you don't usually share that response with them, and I'm guessing it's because that's not really a good connection in terms of their worldview versus what we understand from Scripture. Uh, well, so, it, so what? It, so what it, would you usually go with? Well, uh, there there are several arguments that I feel like are much stronger uh, in in my book, In Search of the True Life, which incidentally I wrote for people of my former worldview. Many Christians read it and are benefited by it. It compares over 20 religions. But I didn't write it for Christians. I wrote it because I I, I discovered there was a glut of, of books on comparative religion that were written by Christians for Christians. And I thought, now wait a second, we're forgetting the Great Commission here. Yeah, We need to write in such a way to attract uh, the attention of people that are of another worldview. Mm-hmm. But in that book, uh, I, I talk about 13 reasons why I no longer believe in reincarnation. And the first reason in the list is this, that if, uh, if evil and imperfection, sorrow or pain, all of these things are the result of negative karma reaped 
from a former life, uh -huh. then how do suffering and evil and imperfection and pain make their appearance in a soul's first incarnation? Uh, uh, there's never been uh, proof of somebody being born into this world with a clean slate and no negative karma to bring. Right. And no uh, negative emotion, no negative things going on in his or her life. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's provable that a person uh, is the, uh, the evidence of a first, uh, a first incarnation of a soul on its evolutionary journey. And this bothers me too. If the soul is perfect to begin with, why does it digress into evil? Right. That progression may take place because that's the whole idea that through the reincarnation progress process, brother, we progress from a less evolved state to a more highly evolved state. But if that soul is pure and clean to begin with, then why does it digress into evil in order to progress or progress into righteousness? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. What what type of answers have you heard people try to give to that, which are coming from a belief in reincarnation and karma? Do they have any? Not really. Not really. Uh, no, they. That that's a question they can't really answer. Yeah. Uh, and one of the one of the next things that really convinced me, because by the way, uh, this may shock some people, but uh, uh, one of the biggest struggles of my life theologically after I got saved was to discard this doctrine of reincarnation. Mm. I had no problem with all the other Far Eastern trappings. Uh, and upon salvation, I divested just about everything else from that belief system. But I had a hard time getting rid of my uh, ideas concerning reincarnation. It took me about a month to sort it all out. Wow. And uh, one, one thing that uh, really spoke to my heart was something you mentioned a while ago, uh, that if there is no remembrance, ordinarily, mm -hmm. of former evil or negative behavior, it reaped a consequence in it, uh, 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 a following life. Right. Then you can't learn from the experience. It's it's not beneficial because you don't know the behavior that caused the problem, and so you can't rectify the situation or you can't resolve it by implementing a, a new and better kind of behavior. Yep. And so the process doesn't make sense because of that. If we could remember our former activity in previous life and see how it does evolve into very negative experiences, then... There's a lesson that's easily learned. Right. But if, if it's completely ignorant of it, then nothing can be learned. Yeah. It has no value. And there are different religions that hold a reincarnation, and I'm sure they, they have very similar beliefs. Um, but do, which, which religions hold to reincarnation? That'd be something I think would be good just to hear. And then also know, uh, they, all these religions don't hold to any knowledge of it in the person of what they did before, which is really problematic. But to my understanding, they don't even know how they're doing in this life either to know if they've even progressed or degressed compared to their life before either. So they don't really have any certainty that they're even moving forward in this life. Is that pretty much how it is in all the religions that hold to reincarnation? They don't even know where they stand in this life based on their progress now? Well, of course, it makes them des desperate to be uh, those that are sensitive and those that are uh, passionate about truth or finding truth, living truth. Uh, it makes them all the more driven. Uh, the guru I studied under taught us that it might take an entire lifetime of being totally devoted to yogic principles to be delivered from the cycle of rebirth. Mm. And then he said, uh, it may even take two or three lifetimes of living the life of the yogi. Uh, and, and so we were driven by this deep desire to escape the cycle of rebirth and, and to move up to the next higher spiritual level. So uh, I gave up everything. Mm. Uh, and 
And part of my main motivation was I loved God. I, I deeply loved God. I just did not know how to get to God. And I think that's something that some Christians dismiss. They don't really realize that there are true lovers of God in other religions. They're just in this muddled mess, in this maze of false ideas that prevents them from getting to God. But uh, I long for God, and, and, and because of that, I, I long to get out of this fleshly kind of existence where you're so insensitive to spiritual things. So, uh, like I told you in the beginning of the program, I, I disciplined my life radically. Mm -hmm. um, every day, it was our... Uh, Every hour has some type of spiritual discipline associated with it. Even eating, even uh, uh, breaking for a meal had some kind of spiritual discipline associated with it because I wanted to escape the cycle of rebirth. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people are like that. Uh, one, one thing, though, that also convinced me uh, that it wasn't logical. I, I, I read the scriptures, of course. Mm -hmm. As a Christian, I, I, I read there's one life and then the judgment. And then I read how uh, the Bible talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb when Jesus comes back again. And uh, I, I'm of the belief that uh, the marriage supper will take place after the Lord sets up his kingdom on the earth completely. Uh, different people have different beliefs in that. Mm -hmm. But my main point is not the timing. My main point is that he said we would sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And I thought, well, how will we recognize that? Mm. If they continued on their uh, evolutionary journey and they've incarnated as other people, uh, then how would you know it's Abraham? How would you know it's Isaac? And yet Jesus talked about certain individuals maintaining their identity for all eternity. Mm-hmm. So I thought, wow, if, if Jesus uh, discarded these ideas about reincarnation, then I should, certainly shouldn't entertain them, uh, uh, because uh, he, he didn't teach reincarnation. Yeah, not and, at all. Uh, of course, uh, I might mention right here, the, uh, the guru I studied under taught us that Jesus was an avatar. Yeah. And, of course, people... People have a different meaning attached to avatars now with video games <laughs> uh, and with the recent movie <laughs> that came out. But uh, in Hinduism, uh, the word avatar means the incarnation of God. And according to many uh, Hindu believers, there have been many avatars. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, the teaching is that Buddha was an avatar. That Jesus was an avatar, among many others. Many of the gurus that have come to this country, like Mayhir Baba, he claimed to be an avatar. Different ones. Uh, so, uh, but he said this, uh, Yogi Bhajan said this, uh, who incidentally confided in some of his closest followers that he himself was Jesus Christ reincarnated, huh. uh, which is the ultimate deception, you know. But he talked, that if Jesus was an avatar, if Jesus was an avatar, then he could only speak the truth. Mm. And later on, that and that kind of came back to me and helped me extricate myself from all of the other beliefs that Yogi Bhajan promoted, because I thought if Jesus could only speak the truth, then I need to inspect what he said. And when I started inspecting what he said... His words went directly contrary to much of what Yogi Bhajan taught. Right. So I thought that this is way too contradictory. Well, that, of course, that's the name of your ministry there, or your yeah. outreach, contradict. Mm -hmm. I thought there's no way, no logical way, that Jesus could have been an avatar within the framework of Hindu right. uh, theology and teach what he taught, because he didn't teach reincarnation, he taught resurrection. Right, absolutely. Uh, and one of the reasons you give here, speaking of uh, contradictions, you said the doctrine of karma in the Hindu belief and cycles of creation seem to be in direct conflict with each other. And I think you kind of addressed some of this already by saying if all souls are eternal or uh, then where does and, and perfect, where does this uh, fault originate from? 
or just as you said, we don't see any person in their first life having a clean slate. That may be some of what you're talking about with uh, how they conflict. Do you mind just talking about that a little bit on how karma uh, and the Hindu belief in cycles of creation seem to conflict? Because I think this cycles of creation will probably be new to a lot of listeners because I don't think too many people are familiar with the fact that Hindus even believe in cycles of creation, not just uh, reincarnation. Right. Well, I, I go into that extensively in the book, In Search of the True Light. Uh, and, it, and it's very complicated. And if I went into much detail, I think I would lose a lot of people. But basically, uh, in their cosmology, they have various cycles that are called kalpas. And uh, say one kalpa consists of 4,320,000,000 years. Mm-hmm. And two kalpas make up a day and a night of Brahma, uh, and uh, a total of 8,640,000,000 years. And then uh, 360 days and nights make up one year of Brahma. And I'm not even going to try and figure out that number. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and then after this certain amount of time, Brahma, the creator god, in Hinduism dies and then this god is reborn. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that that's an outrageous thought that they're the highest gods in their pantheon do not even have an eternal existence. They have temporary existence. And then they go through a reincarnation cycle. But they've also got these um, these shorter ages similar to astrology. Uh, where they've got a, a, a yuga, a Y-U-G-A, mm-hmm. uh, is of various lengths. I won't go into the different lengths of these yugas, and they have different names for different yugas. But one of them is a, uh, a, a time of great spiritual sensitivity and purity in the universe, and then uh, it, it can come to an end... And uh, the next one is a time of great degradation and and uncleanness and perversity and deception and delusion and uh, and uh, and my point was that if uh, you've got this golden age of perfection mm-hmm. where everything is one hundred percent perfect and beautiful and lovely and 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 uh, how does that ever degrade? Yeah, uh, into another cycle of creation that plunges into the opposite depth. There should only be positive karma built up, right? And so it it doesn't really make sense that uh, that reincarnation could be the process by which people achieve perfection, but then these cycles go from good to bad and over and over again, in ad infinitum. For all eternity, and there's no way out of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, speaking of that, uh, one other argument that I, I find to be one of the most powerful with somebody who believes in reincarnation uh, is to show them that, take this for an example, if someone is uh, a thief, mm-hmm. if someone, say, during during his lifetime, let's take a, a easy round number, if someone during his lifetime stole a hundred times, then it would be necessary, if karma is this inexorable law that is pretty much inescapable. Uh, Hinduism does allow for certain things like bathing in the river Ganges is supposed to do away with your karma, some of your karma. Mm-hmm. But anyway, for the most part, it's inescapable. Then that person has to be subjected to theft. A right. hundred times, at least, a hundred for a hundred. Well, then those, maybe there's 20 thieves that steal from this person, each of them five times, you know, just to throw some numbers at them. Then every one of those thieves that stole from this person five times, they have to be robbed five times. And mm-hmm. then the robbers that robbed them have to be robbed. And then the robbers that robbed the robbers that robbed them, that robbed the original thief, have to be robbed. And so it, it, 
it, it just grows exponentially mm-hmm. into something that, that is absolutely impossible to solve. Mm-hmm. There, there's no way to resolve all of that negative karma. It, it's out of control. And the other thing that really blows my mind, uh, or at one point it blew my mind when I tried to wrap my mind around it, when I looked at it logically, when I looked at uh, reincarnation as instead of an adherent, I, I stepped back and I thought, I'm going to look at this with logic and see if it makes sense. Then one other thing that bothered me is that if uh, if one of those thieves robbed the initial initial thief mm-hmm. that I was talking about a few moments ago, did that thief make the free will choice to rob the original thief? Uh-huh. Or was he forced by this whole system of karma to assume that role so the original thief's karma could be paid off? Yeah. Then he, then he becomes an unwitting victim of this whole process. And, and if he was forced into stealing from the original thief, is it just for him to then suffer for something he was forced into being involved in? Does that make sense? No, it makes complete sense. I, I think you, in the book, you refer to that as fatalism, right? Is that what you called right. it? Yeah, so like things well, being dictated upon you. And I, I even liked an argument you gave in there, doing good. If I see someone who's suffering, I shouldn't help them out of that suffering because they deserve that lot that they're currently experiencing. And if I help them out of that suffering, am I then even doing bad because I'm helping someone? Because I'm technically relieving the negative karma that they should be experiencing. Uh, so yeah, I, I really loved uh, just how you were able to put together all these inconsistencies and questions and uh, that really aren't answerable from the Hindu system or any of this type of uh, reincarnation karma system. Uh, Mike, to close, I like uh, I really liked your thirteen arguments that you gave uh, for why re- uh, for why resurrection is the true path and not reincarnation. Uh, the the last ones you gave, most of them pertain to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, so would you mind just closing uh, us off, since the goal here is to focus on sharing the gospel, uh, how does the person and work of Jesus Christ of his life, death, and resurrection really put a nail in the coffin of this doctrine of reincarnation? Well, Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Mm. And he that believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he taught the the doctrine of resurrection, which is uh, the r- resurrection of the physical body that we live in when we're in this world. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I've had people, I've had people reject that on the basis of uh, some situations where supposedly, uh, just to put out one example, a, a person dies at sea and their body is dumped over in the ocean and eaten by numerous creatures in the ocean so that the remains of that person are scattered all over the ocean, and then the, and then the fish that devoured the person end up being devoured by crabs and, and then by other lesser organisms mm-hmm. until the body no longer is recognizable or even uh, in one uh, intact mm-hmm. at all. How can that person be resurrected? And my response to that, is that God doesn't need the entire body. Mm -hmm. He chooses to use some of the previous substance. Even if it's molecular in size, he chooses to use some of the previous substance to birth into being a resurrected body. Mm -hmm. Uh, he He didn't have to use a handful of dust when he created Adam in the beginning, but he chose to create Adam that way. And he doesn't have to use the substance of what our previous body was to make a resurrected body. He could just speak it into existence. Mm -hmm. But he chooses to. And the next question is, uh, why do we need a resurrected body? If we're already in heaven, in a solar state, and perfectly content and peaceful, why do we need a resurrected body? And, And the answer is because we need a body for the realm for which we are ordained. 
uh, and our our ultimate destiny, unknown to a lot of Christians, our ultimate destiny is not to spend eternity in heaven. Our ultimate destiny is to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ in a restored paradise world. Yes, uh, amen. That's very clear mm-hmm. in Scripture. And so uh, I believe it will be a physical world, though it will be perfected. And so we will need perfected physical bodies to function in a perfected physical world. And uh, and that's why it's so important. And uh, also the doctrine of reincarnation, and I'll end with this. I hope I'm not going too long. No, you're not, not at all. Of, uh, the doctrine of reincarnation leaves no room for uh, uh, grace coming from God. Mm-hmm. And the message of Jesus was all about grace and about the blood of Jesus blotting out sin, uh, which flies directly in the face of the whole idea of karma and reincarnation. Mm-hmm. If I can go to my knees, I can be the worst, most corrupt individual uh, in a community and go to an altar in some church and be forgiven of my sins and my sins are washed away. Now, that, that does not mean all consequences cease uh, to be, because it, if a person has committed evil, there may be consequences. Right. Uh, there may be things that result, disease, incarceration, who knows, you know, what uh, certain uh, results may be. But there is no trailing uh, of my life of all this negative karma that makes uh, tit for tat things happen to me that, you know, if, if that was true, then Paul the Apostle would have had to been killed numerous times. He, right. he was behind the murder of many Christians. Mm-hmm. So if reincarnation was true, once he became a Christian, he would have had to be killed and then reincarnated many times and murdered in each one of those incarnations to, yeah. uh, to make up for uh, his errors in life. Well, the blood of Jesus Christ washes all of that clean. Amen. And we are forgiven. And God said, their sin and their iniquity will I remember no more. No more. And, uh, and that's because God is a personal God. The universe is not a machine that runs according to a, uh, a certain installed program called karma and reincarnation. Mm-hmm. It, uh, the universe is ruled by a personal God who can be appealed to in a personal way. And he has the power to wipe out your record and to say, I give you a new beginning. I forgive you. And uh, and to know that kind of forgiveness is amazing. It's Absolutely. miraculous. It's wonderful. It's not uh, something you can define intellectually. It's something you have to experience to appreciate. Yeah. And uh, Jesus, either Jesus was a liar and insane mm-hmm. uh, when he said... Um, that we could come to him and be forgiven. He said, the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sin. He was either an egomaniac and a liar, insane, or he was who he said he was. There's really no middle ground. Yeah. And, and I would, would, of course, you and I believe he right. is not Absolutely. an egomaniac, nor was he insane. He was God on earth in the human body. Absolutely. Because only God can forgive sin. Right. And uh, that's the most marvelous thing about Christianity. Absolutely. The hope of the resurrection, exemplified by the Lord Jesus himself, because he rose from the dead. He said, because I live, you shall live also. Yeah, and with the, um, and the good news of this is that we have certainty of that salvation, because his tomb is empty. Um, and so I think right. that's, that's really what helps me when I speak to someone who... Uh, is trapped in a different religious system, knowing that what I'm sharing is really good news, and it's the best news they're ever going to hear. And even if they reject it, I tell them, I go, I don't care where you find yourself down the line in the future, this word's going to be with you, and it's true, and it's the best news you'll ever hear. <laughs> and uh, Absolutely. And it, it just makes uh, speaking this with others uh, that much easier, I think, when we see and understand that they really have no hope in the system that they're in, and this is the only way that they will have life. Um, so, you know, one last thing I'd yeah. like to share is that uh, the man who won me to the Lord was very wise, mm. because right right before we were about to pray, and I was about to accept Jesus as Lord of my life, uh, my intellect kicked in, and I said, Kent, uh, I said, i got to be honest with you, 
before I pray this prayer, I can never give up my belief in reincarnation. I'm sold on reincarnation. It's the only way that mm. I believe things function. And he just looked at me with this big smile, full of love, and he said, don't worry about that, just try Jesus. And I said, well, Kent, I got another problem area. I don't believe that a loving God would ever send anyone to hell. I don't believe in hell. Mm. And he looked at me again with this big smile and said, don't worry about that, just try Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I brought up a couple of other things that I said I could not resolve in my thinking about Christian doctrine. Well, like the, the validity of the Bible, I said, I'll never believe the Bible is God's inspired word. It's just written by uh, a number of about 40 people that uh, they put their beliefs and their writings together into one book. I said, I don't believe that's God's word. He said, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. And so he kept bypassing these arguments I would throw up because he understood something that a lot of Christians listening to this uh, interview need to understand, that you cannot convince someone of various doctrines of, that are true in the Word of God when they're trying to comprehend them uh, with an unregenerated mind or a, a, a mind that is bound by a fallen state. Mm -hmm. uh, because that intellect is defiled and corrupted and and they can't understand truth. The, the, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. They can't comprehend it. So the main thing is you've got to get them to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then once I once I came to Jesus and had this true personal encounter with him, I, I believe the Bible is God's inspired word. I believe there is a hell, and I understand why it exists. And I no longer believe in the reincarnation. So all those issues were much more easily solved. Once I had the mind of Christ, the Bible said we received that as part of our inheritance. And once I was born again, mm -hmm. once I uh, received eternal life. So that's the crux of the matter. We need to avoid some people's arguments, just get them to Jesus. Yep. And then Jesus can get truth into them. Right, present the gospel. So that's the message uh, that saves. That's the power of God for salvation. Uh, thanks, Mike, so much for taking the time to to share this information with us. I, I do pray that it is is helpful to listeners, uh, and that uh, I just also wanted to have you on to help people be aware of your ministry. Uh, it's Mike Shreve Ministries. I'll have a link to that uh, on episode thirty. I'm on thirty three now, I believe. So it's episode thirty three of Andy Ra at andyrasman dot com underneath Reconnect Podcast. Uh, you'll also see links to Deeper Revelation books. Uh, where you can get access to Mike's books, such as Powerful Prayers for Supernatural Results, 65 Promises of God for Your Child, as well as the book that we've been talking about right now, which is In Search of the True Light. Uh, I highly recommend this book. If you do happen to have my book, I would say you need to pick his book up next uh, because it, he goes into so much more detail than I do on some of this stuff. And uh, a lot of his questions and the way he approaches it really is addressed to a person who is trapped in New Age thinking or Eastern spirituality. It's definitely written for them. Uh, just even reading it can help get you in the right mindset for communicating the truth of God's Word of someone uh, who is really locked into that uh, religious system. Uh, so, Mike, thank you so much, and uh, I'll, I'll definitely look forward to communicating with you more in the future about um, reincarnation, karma, and much more. Well, that sounds exciting to me. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Incidentally, my website is shreveministries.org. Just Shreve Ministries, S-H-R-E-V-E, ministries.org. And uh, I have an outreach website called thetruelight.net, thetruelight.net. And uh, I invite your listeners to come to either of those. Good. Thanks so much, Mike. God bless you. Hey, God bless you, and thanks for the privilege. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, share this episode on all of your social media sites and with your email contacts, people who will benefit from listening to the show. Thank you for listening. Reconnect us, O oh Lord.